Good evening and welcome to the first ever All Things Spinal. Uh, I'm your host, Thomas Deckers. Uh, I'm a spinal specialist, physiotherapist and strength and conditioning coach. Uh, by way of background, I am based here in Cork in the south of Ireland. Uh, clinically, I work uh, in an advanced practice role at Cork University Hospital, where I work within the neurosurgery team. And there uh, I have both a role in triage and rehabilitation. And I also work uh, in consultant private practice, which is where uh, we're broadcasting from this evening. Um, I'm involved in some research in athletes uh, with back pain. And I also teach on all uh, matters related to spinal rehabilitation and therapeutic exercise for spinal pain. So on a personal note, I've been intrigued by the spine really for uh, most of my life and it you know continues to fascinate me on a daily basis. Um, it, you know the anatomy, the function I just think is uh, beautiful in addition to its architecture. Uh, but the spine as a whole really is the region of the body that causes the great amount of uh, global disability. Uh, for the uh, global population and uh, it really presents some of the greatest challenges that we face as musculoskeletal uh, clinicians you know but uh, for all those challenges uh, I'm a true believer that you know we can see some um, uh, great changes and great capacity of patients to improve and for us to help them along that uh, journey and so I think the role of the, um, the clinician with spinal pain is, is really pivotal uh, hopefully for the better, but unfortunately, uh, clinicians uh, can also uh, make things somewhat worse for, for the patient as well. And so with that in mind, uh, the aim of All Things Spinal is hopefully that it forms, uh, acts like a platform that uh, where matters related to the spine can be you know, discussed and where we can kind of dive into the minutiae of spinal pain and hopefully continue to move the needle uh, towards uh, improvement of patient care and optimum care for those with spinal pain. All right. Now, I'm a huge believer that no one person uh, has all the answers, and certainly I don't. And to that effect, I'm going to be bringing speakers uh, who are experts in the fields and particularly have a particular interest in certain aspects of uh, spinal uh, uh, function and pain uh, from fields, yes, from physiotherapy, as is uh, my field, but I've also got colleagues from neurosurgery, from pain medicine, uh, biomechanics, neuroscience, clinical psychology. We've got a whole host of people hopefully coming on in uh, future sessions to be able uh, to uh, give their knowledge. And we're going to hopefully distill that knowledge into uh, accessible information that can be used by clinicians in their practice. So uh, welcome to All Things Spinal, and I hope you join me in the journey as we delve into these matters. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to introduce our very first guest, who is uh, the amazing Adam Dobson. How are you, Adam? I'm very well. Very well, Tom. Thanks yeah, for having great. me. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thanks for uh, coming over uh, the airways this evening to um, uh, feed us your, your knowledge on the matter. Adam is a, a spinal specialist physiotherapist. He works in the South Tees NHS Foundation in the northeast of England, um, uh, supports people with back pain. He has a similar um, uh, back pain fascination as do I. So uh, really delighted to have this gentleman on and his special area of interest of radicular pain and radiculopathy. Uh, Adam, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about um, your professional journey and what you're doing at the moment. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm a specialist in uh, spines um, within the NHS. So I have a, a dual role. So one side of my job is to work in, in a triage, spinal triage clinic, primarily towards lower back related conditions, which is even more niche uh, than, than spines, I guess, isn't it, in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do, that's part of my time. And then I'm also a lead for the lead for a residential rehabilitation program for people with chronic disabling pain. Mm -hmm. So heavily into rehabilitation 
um, and then I see a lot of radicular type presentations in the clinic and that's kind of my additional interest I guess is is around nerve root problems of the lumbar spine so um, so I work full-time um, prior to working in the NHS I worked privately at a place called the Nuffield uh, in in Stockton locally mm. to me I had a great mentor uh, we developed lots of different services we developed a back pain service a knee pain service and he really kind of elevated my kind of interest in spines I was a little bit divided between knees and spines but he kind of had a a great passion took me on a number of cognitive functional therapy courses uh, as a as a younger clinician okay so thanks to him you know we've pulled you into the spinal world rather than <laughs> lost you to the world of the knee absolutely yeah knees what knees knees don't exist to me no um, no we've no we've no interest in that stuff um i uh, know so that's so that's that that's great adam great to have you on and so um so look let's let's jump into it as you said you know you've got a, got a special interest in ridiculous pain ridiculous presentations great to see you as someone obviously uh, who uh, uh, has a, an academic interest but also is is clinical in the space and treats people on a daily basis with this stuff so um, we're going to try and blend that uh, academic interest and that clinical expertise today so um maybe a nice way to start off with this i'm sure a, a lot of the viewers already are aware of this but it'd be nice maybe to set the scene just you know to get some proper terminology uh, straight around what is radicular pain what is radiculopathy okay so it's probably helpful to orient ourselves to what part of the body we're talking about i guess so um so the uh the spinal cord ends at about the l1 vertebra uh, that then gives rise to kind of free hanging descending nerves that run down the spinal column and then they exit the spinal column at, at, at uh, either level. So those connecting nerves um, are known as nerve roots. So uh, roots, radic meaning, radix meaning uh, the start of. So the start of the, can, the uh, kind of peripheral nerves, I guess. They are a little bit distinct from uh, peripheral nerves, but still, um, they certainly uh, are very different to the spinal cord itself. So operational definitions, before I get into operational definitions, it's probably worth pointing out that um, we, we can't entirely distill the activity in sensory neurons uh, uh, to uh, the nature of pain, of course. So we'll, we'll kind of park that concept <laughs> for, for to the side for now so just kind of bear in that mind so we have radiculopathy uh radicular pain uh i would term radicular sensory gain or sensory gain as a particular uh group and then we have radicular or neurogenic claudication and then we have somatic referred pain um so with lumbar radiculopathy this refers to a loss of nerve root function so mm -hmm. if that be motor reflex sensory uh, mm -hmm. it's not into itself a pain condition it's a clinical state which usually reflects a conduction slowing or a conduction block within the axons of sensory dorsal and or ventral uh, motor neurons usually has typical neurological boundaries so that's kind of where those uh uh, dermatoma maps kind of come in uh shall i keep going thomas yeah okay? well yeah. Uh, yeah so like that gives us a, a good background um you know where the a radiculopathy would be as you said uh some form of deficit uh, reflexes dermatomes myotomes where radicular pain will be a uh, pain that arises from the nerve trunk and though or sorry from from the nerve root itself in the absence of those um, uh, neurological deficits. We start to go into those other terminologies, if you don't mind, Adam. So we've got things like uh, radicular somatic, radicular claudication. Uh, yeah. Maybe clarify those for us. So radicular, uh, lumbar radicular pain is pain that is, for lack of a better word, arising from hyper excitability or mm. topic discharges within the dorsal lumbar nerve roots or the dorsal 
root ganglia. So um, more simply, it's a type of pain experienced when the axons of sensory nerves are injured, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by that definition, um, one would follow that it's neuropathic in nature um, if we're talking about axons. So a, a, a kind of more kind of precise term might be radicular neuropathic pain. So uh, reported inherently uh, neuropathics or electric shocks, burning, shooting, pain, those kind of qualities into the leg itself. Um, uh, pain below the knee is, is kind of semi kind of uh, typical. So pain into the leg, the buttock, the thigh, but pain below the knee that is worse than the back is, you know, we're probably getting into uh, the likelihood of radicular involvement. Quite mm -hmm. severe, relentless, quite alarming. Um, and this does often accompany radicular, um, radiculopathy. And it's mm -hmm. often turned a painful radiculopathy mm -hmm. when, they, when they're kind of coexisting. Radicular sensory gain are those additional uh, pleasant or unpleasant sensory symptoms. So paresthesia, dysesthesia, allodynia, hyperallergesia, so pins and needles, tingling, running water, uh, ants moving on your skin, all of these strange additional symptoms that go on in the presence of an injured nerve root. And just to clarify there with that, uh, uh, this is a question I get asked a lot. So if someone comes in, presents with radicular type, uh, with, with radicular pain, so they got pain, we'll say that's in a nice, uh, clear uh, neuroanatomical dermatome and they get paresthesia or they get that sensation of uh, running water or they get um, uh, that kind of crawling sensation in, in, in their leg. Just to be clear, that's still ridiculous pain, even though it's, they're getting symptoms on top of pain, it's still ridiculous pain rather than a radiculopathy is really the differentiation is that uh, is that loss of function. And so where you start getting that gain in function or yeah. uh, gain in sensation around paresthesia, dysesthesia, that is that is not a radiculopathy. Yeah, so the, yeah, a, a loss of function uh, uh, and a, a gain of function. So it's nice to look at it as a kind of table of mm. things that represent loss and things represent gain. Interestingly, yeah. Zeus often coexist yeah the interesting thing is and maybe the, the, the thing that some people find difficult to get around their head is that that gain in function um, i mean nobody wants paresthesia or dysesthesia so that there's a kind of a, a misnomer nearly that we call it a gain <laughs> except that it's it's something that people don't want to gain it's not a positive thing but it is yeah. it is a gain in sensation yeah 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 an addition uh, or an yeah. increase of, of yeah. uh, activity uh, yeah. rather than a reduction yeah. yeah super so now that's all nice and well and certainly in um, in the neurosurgery service at uh, cork university hospital where i work we'll see some lovely clear-cut um radicular presentations they come in with pain pain in the, and, and that pain uh straddles into a particular dermatome and, and if they have a radiculopathy you'll see a, a concomitant uh, reduction in function in, in either sensation or myotome or in their reflex and sometimes it all fits together perfectly um, more often than not and certainly the patients i see who've been on the waiting list for a while uh, they will have a very muddied presentation pain that will kind of uh, travel well outside the dermatome will cross multiple dermatomes and when we start to see maybe work from uh, anina schmidt's group where they we start to see this uh, kind of remote um, neuroinflammation where uh, inflammation within nerve roots can spread proximal and distal to the lesion we might start to get an idea how that gross sensitivity in the nerve and the nervous system starts to increase and it's less clear cut and so do you think there's um, a role then for uh, other terminologies there's a recent paper published by joe nace and colleagues recently in the, the lancet rheumatology about pain phenotyping uh, where we've nociceptive neuropathic and nociplastic um, as opposed to calling it radicular or radiculopathy have you any thoughts on kind of that differentiation mm -hmm. whether we whether we should just be calling everything neuropathic so to speak so yeah i, th I think there is a little bit of merit in 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 some cases so uh, painful radiculopathy as you know it's a very strange condition uh, mm. it can kind of upend your life very quickly 
and mm. it's very it's very odd and unusual so um so having a a discussion about the nature of those symptoms from a neuropathic perspective i think that it, it kind of aids education so it aids understanding it aids education and potentially can uh, help demystify and help with kind of well-being and we know that uh, that patients who suffer with neuropathic pain value that understanding mm. that's it's kind of well documented so i think in in this particular instance from an educational perspective and in turn potentially a, a treatment perspective we'll get into that i think the delineation of uh, a kind of sliding scale towards more uh, neuropathic presentations to one end um, or kind of typical uh, and then maybe more nociceptive ridiculous which we can maybe talk about mm. i think that it does have value uh, from an educational and potentially a management perspective mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so certainly yeah 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 i mean it's um uh, nerves nerves can be strange in their presentation i you know saw a few patients this afternoon this evening um and i'd say maybe 50 percent of people i see with spinal pain maybe more will have a degree of neuropathic pain going on a lot of patients i will see say this evening had once upon a time a clear reticular presentation and as we start to get persistent pain uh, processes happening uh, that that you know is it is it still a reticular pain or now is it a full-blown neuropathic presentation where we can't attribute to a single nerve root. Uh, that's generally the, the progression I tend to see, um, which then <clears throat> begs the question of what is actually happening? <clears throat> a, a good question. Um, so uh, let's talk about radiculopathy first. It's probably helpful to work with one and then ease into the other. So uh, the primary kind of causes of radiculopathy uh, in a very general sense is pressure uh, and, and inflammation. And then the downstream qu quite messy interrelated mechanisms that follow on from that are venous congestion, edema, uh, ischemia, demyelination, and then axon degeneration. So there is a relationship with all of those mechanisms and they kind of bring each other on, I guess they have a relationship with each other and with pressure and inflammation. So it can be quite difficult to explain these things because there's a lot of kind of moving parts. Um, but this is the primary uh, kind of uh, um, element of, the, of, of this uh, kind of problem. So neurons uh, or neurons, they have this, uh, uh, vascular pressure gradient okay. so high pressure oxygenated blood is pumped in to the nerve root mm -hmm. by the radicular arteries <clears throat> gradually decreases in pressure as it flows into the fascicles and into the arterioles um, and then eventually into the capillaries that surround the axons and the cell bodies of uh, of the nerve root so it's thousands of, of axons it then okay. gives up its oxygen um, and then the deoxygenated blood drains out through the venules and then out through the nerve root. So that's kind of, that's, I, I like to think that in some ways uh, it's a kind of low grade vascular problem. So that's kind of when it's working okay. If there's any pressure on the nerve root, on the neurons, uh, it'll disrupt the pressure gradient and essentially deoxygenated blood can't leave so well. Um, and oxygenated blood can't move in. So you've got deoxygenated blood backing up and then oxygenated blood can't readily move in mm -hmm. uh, across that kind of nerve, blood nerve barrier. And that's like a, like a, like a, like a traffic light system that's gone wrong. You've got people being backed up on either side. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good analogy. I'll write that down, Tom. Yeah. Uh, so that that's venous congestion. So mm. it's 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 a phenomenon that we see across the body, um, and uh, someone once referred to it as a, a kind of a low grade um, kind of compartment syndrome. So without oxygen, uh, nerves they can't repolarize, they can't create action potentials. 
so sure. the action potentials fizzle out. Uh, if you've ever slept on your arm in bed uh, uh, for a period of time and you wake up and your arm's completely floppy uh, and you can't move it and then it starts to come back gradually, that's the phenomenon that you're experiencing. It's not necessarily pathological, certainly reversible uh, in most cases. Um, and uh, if that goes on long enough, um, if the intravascular pressure continues, uh, the fluid in the capillaries will start to leak into the spaces. They'll cross the barrier into where the axons live, the mm. blood nerve barrier, uh, creating more pressure. And, that, uh, and, that, and that's called edema. So you can start to have fluid uh, moving into those spaces mm -hmm. uh, from the capillaries. So that kind of uh, is uh, still probably reversible, but we're starting to move along that kind of... Uh, pathological mm. uh, uh, kind of mechanistic. Uh, Any idea on time frames when we're simply talking around that um, edema? I suppose, of course, it depends on the degree of compression, but, um, you know, any ideas when that, you know, what sort of period of time that we're speaking about before we start to progress to uh, more distinct nerve injury? I, I think even with small amounts of pressure, uh, uh, in the basic in the basic science work, even small amounts of pressure can lead to this problem pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, and we know that nerve roots are a little bit more vulnerable to that, uh, particularly the uh, the kind of the exit in nerve roots because they are they're kind of fixed in place, so they don't have the same kind of movement capabilities as the uh, the transit in nerve roots. So, so they're a little bit kind of uh, more susceptible to succumbing to pressure in, in its many forms, if it be disc herniation or if it be uh, kind of narrowing of the, the foramina itself. Okay. And what happens after that uh, section then, after that period? So we've got uh, compression leading to edema. Um, what comes after that if, if compression is continued? So if uh, if if you, if the, the neurons can't get oxygen, uh, essentially um, you ha you end up with this ischemic environment. Mm. If if the nerve roots in an ischemic environment, then the myelin, uh, um, the swan cells start to break down, and that's demyelination. Uh, that okay. carries on further. You end up with destruction of the axons. Just to say that clinically, these things kind of represent radiculopathy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the clinical presentation of venous congestion edema usually is reversible radiculopathy in terms mm -hmm. of clinical manifestations. Um, but it starts to become quite irreversible if we're starting to lose the kind of architectures breaking down in sure. the presence of ischemia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so time is a factor. Um, degree of compression is a factor. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as... Uh, it's very difficult really to to clarify um, you know what stages are related to pain or related to different pain states because a lot of this work has been done on animals on mice really hasn't it um, so we can we can get some idea about how the how the symptoms progress uh, sorry how the uh, the disease if you like or the pathology progresses but we don't know necessarily how each stage may be links to pain, although we will assume that the more the the more inflammation, the more ischemia, the more edema that's going on, it's probably going to be a correlation with an increase in symptoms. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, so um, many of those same mechanisms that lead to radiculopathy also can lead to radicular neuropathic pain so i've kind of introduced them early so then we we don't necessarily have to retouch on them but it's it's yeah, a sure. kind of a it's a it's a different phenomena with a similar etiology that that's the way yeah. I, I would kind of think about it. so um with radicular pain neuropathic pain um so along the membranes of the axon between the gaps in the myelin you have these very fancy uh, structures called nodes of Ranvier um, mm. and embedded within them you have ion channels so think of these as um, uh, con conduction pit stops um, when the 
when the nerve root is demyelinated, the axon channels that are transported down from the cell bodies mistake these areas for nodes of Ranvier and they deposit themselves in that area. And that creates this term ectopic impulse generating sites. So essentially yeah. the, the, the nerve root is firing abnormally. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so ectopic means in the wrong place. And that is how we get neuropathic pain. Okay, brilliant. So look, we've discussed our terminology. It's always good to get that right. We've, we've gone uh, nice and deep into the neurophysiology into the pathophysiology of, of how that, um, uh, actually happens at a, at a cellular level, well, not at a cellular level, but certainly at a macro level or at a, or at a tissue level. And you know, what, how does, let's bring it back out to the patient. Let's bring it back out to the clinical presentation. Um, if we talk about maybe the, uh, the, the amount of people who were actually seeing with these conditions, you know, what do you think is actually the, the lifetime prevalence or the prevalence of this in the general population? Is there any, we, we got a bead on that data more or less? Yeah. So, uh, Kiki published a paper on this, uh, back in 2008. So it's right. quite old now and probably needs to be reviewed again, but they, they cite anywhere between, 1.2% 43% lifetime prevalence so it's quite yeah, a, quite a range, big range. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're, they're very clear on that aren't they yeah yeah, um, yeah. so so I, I think the higher estimate it may be uh closer but the the answer is we we don't really know what the the prevalence is because the the data is uh um particularly problematic in terms of the heterogeneity problem yeah. that we can so, get. Like if, yeah, we get on to that, because really ultimately if we look at, let's say, uh, prevalence of back pain, I think the prevalence of back pain, uh, people would say, you know, back pain effectively, it's just a symptom within a region. So normally within research, we'll say at the lower end of the 12th rib, rib to the gluteal fold is considered back pain. And maybe it's easier to do epidemiological studies based on that. Have you had back pain this year? Have you had back pain in the last month? Have you had back pain in the last ever in your lifetime? To say whether someone has had radicular pain or radiculopathy actually requires a diagnosis because lots of different types of pains can go into the leg. So it's very difficult maybe to do that, certainly from a retrospective point of view. Uh, if you do a prospective study, you can you could probably do it, but then you need someone to really diagnose it as being proper radicular pain rather than just being pain in a region, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think like 60% of people uh, who have back pain also have some degree of leg pain. There we so, go. so uh, you know, and a, a proportion of that will be radicular, somatic, um, and uh, and the kind of the the labelling or the terminology used in a lot of these papers is just so wide ranging mm. that and they don't often report how they've come to their their diagnosis or their use of the terminology. So it's yeah. very difficult to uh, develop any inferences when we don't really know if we're talking about ten different populations. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think about my own case load, like in the neurosurgery department in, nearly everyone is walking in with a degree of neuropathic presentation of which a proportion would, would be a clear radicular so i couldn't i couldn't give you stats there because that's a very biased population in my private work um you know it, i might see uh, 50 percent of people walking in the door with with, with back pain versus 50 percent with a neuropathic presentation and their back pain but again that's that's not a scientific way of going about it those are just people who seek care Funnel what's in. actually on yeah. the ground yeah ex ex exactly those are, and um so it's very hard to maybe answer that but it's out there and which kind of um i don't think it gets as much airtime actually as back pain it's kind of like oh you get you, you've, you've got back pain or you've got radicular pain or sciatica and people know about it and hear about it but um i feel in some ways that with back pain gets uh uh you know, and rightly so, because it's, it's more prevalent, but it gets a bigger share of the pie with regards to interest. Um, but the, the burden of uh, ridiculous presentations is really high. You know, if I look at the level of distress of patients walking in with a neuropathic presentation, ridiculous presentation, 
versus someone coming in with a back pain presentation. Don't get me wrong, back pain can be hugely disabling, but those who come in with an acute radicular pain, those who come in with a uh, with a, a chronic um, neuropathic presentation that has almost uh, that has uh, taken over their leg nearly are in really high degrees of, of distress. And I'll commonly see patients coming in and saying, "Look, I've had back pain for years. It was bad and painful, but now I've got nerve pain, and it's like something I've never had before." You know, if you could cut off my leg, I would. I'd let you do it. Um, ironically, that would make not only give them uh, a, a less a leg give them more pain in that region but it also wouldn't wouldn't affect their their uh, their sciatica so to speak because the issue is in their back um but so you know what are your thoughts around that with the level of disability and suffering we see in ridiculous presentations compared to compared to the back yeah so uh the, there was a nice paper uh by uh ryan et al um mm. she interviewed 14 people with uh with uh persistent radicular pain and uh yeah it it's highly disruptive three of those people in that study reported having suicidal ideation mm. Mm. so mm. so they you know i think i think it it's the term sciatica i feel can be as a very antiquated ambiguous term can be often trivialized i think and it, and often just to mean any kind of pain into the back of the leg yeah. when in in actual fact these these conditions can be uh they can destroy people's lives so yeah, uh, yeah. it definitely needs more attention uh, the other thing i would say is that it's for many people it can be a very protracted problem so it can be a problem that can go on for a long time and despite our efforts, a small group of people will not get better. Um, yeah. Despite yeah. our efforts, so you know we certainly need to shine a light on 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 this. That there isn't that much evidence into the psychological burden of people with uh, radicular pain, uh, 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 and certainly not any evidence into if there's any causal uh inferences kind of feeding back into the problem but financial issues mental health problems uh not being able to um to to live your life you know it's a, a really quite devastating condition in in some cases yes yeah, yeah it, it, it it really is which brings us nicely to okay well what do we do about it in clinic and of course um i know we've kind of discussed maybe how to how to theoretically uh, diagnose it, but okay, let's let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. How um, how do we kind of really clarify our diagnosis via our assessment? So we let's say a patient comes in with back and leg pain. Um, what are we looking at, at from a, a, a clinical examination? So we should all be doing a. Uh, a, a neuro neurological examination with any patient really uh, with pain below the buttock line uh, or at least as far or at least below the knee at the very least and uh, that should involve your reflexes that should involve involve your your sensory retesting uh, in the dermatomal distribution and it should involve your myotomes and so uh, as well as neuromechanosensitivity tests your straight leg raise your slump test your pro knee bend and those would be the 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 trajectory I would, we would do in the neurosurgery service where we're really looking for hard neurology so hard deficits where we can say okay there's a distinct nerve root involvement there's a distinct deficit in function and then if you attribute that to a certain uh, presentation on an mri scan then that's really a surgical target for this for the surgeon so we have to be very specific from that point of view but of course uh, lots of uh, presentations don't have such a clear-cut presentation and so what else is out there other than our hard neurology signs uh, uh adam you know you're just, you're, are there some other subtle sensory signs that you know we've spoken about this let us let yeah. us let us know your thoughts about it so i i would encompass that everything you've said there tom uh very uh, eloquently i would encompass that there's a nice paper by steins that that looks at i would refer to it as clusters so when you're okay. looking at clusters of signs and symptoms it, there's kind of uh, a number of items. Uh, if you score more than five, I think, is it five? 
I could be uh, get myself wrong there. Uh, it, it's kind of eighty three percent probability that they have radicular involvement. So it includes uh, their kind of pain and pain distribution. Pain below the knee, as we know, is quite uh, in keeping with radicular pain. Pain in the below the knee that's worse than their back. Sensory symptoms, positive mechanical sensitivity. So that 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 Stein's paper is is a good place to start. Just to yeah, also to we'll get a reference for for that, and we'll pop it in the show notes after this. What? Uh, just to add to that as well is is that sometimes certainly people can present with singular uh, features. So a patient could present with uh, a, a foot drop, for instance, uh, have, have no pain symptoms, but certainly the history may suggest. So getting to know the context, getting to know the history uh, and considering individual signs and weighting those up as well is, is important. Um so just to get back to sentry, yeah, so we've had a good, we had a bit of a discussion on offline, didn't we, Tom, about mm. uh, the, the, the merit and, uh, and the approach with, with sentry symptoms. So there's a nice paper by Anina Schmidt just from last year looking at uh, a standardised approach to uh, assessing for sentry deficits in patients who we suspect may have a sensory radiculopathy. Yeah. Um, my, my my kind of mind's changed a little bit. So I did a podcast, the Back Pain podcast, with Anina uh, a few years ago. Uh, my mind's changed a little bit uh, in, in that time. Um, and uh, so we know that people, um, if we look at the studies that look at quanta, quantitative sensory testing, we know that people with persistent pain do have sensory deficits that they're not aware of, um, but it tends to be arguably preclinical. Um, we do see those in, in people with diabetic, diabetic neuropathy as well. The problem with sensory radiculopathy, I think, is that without a convincing report, any finding is going to be a little thin. So let, let me use an example. I know I'm rambling, Tom. Let me uh, All right. use an example. Don't worry, so I'll you, jump in if, if, if I feel the ramble offends my soul too much. How many jump? Yeah, uh, uh, it, it might. Um, <laughs> so so let, let's say you've got a patient in the clinic. Um, yeah. They, they don't report any sensory changes in their legs. So you, you ask them uh, a self-report. They say, no, I've got no numbness, no, no sensory changes in the leg. You indiscriminately test their light touch appreciation. So mm -hmm. two circles as per Anina's approach, two circles around the front of their thigh, two circles around the back of the thigh. Uh, let's say they, they report they've got a two finger width patch uh, that feels a little lighter on the left side. So maybe in keeping with the L2 dermatome. Okay. Um, the problem with that is we've already primed the patient with, to, to maybe give us a positive report. Uh, which I think makes it a little bit more less reliable. Arguably, if you've got a, a dense sensory change in your leg, would you not be aware of it? I think that's a, a potential uh, um, kind of negative. I'd also say that the the approach of, of kind of circular checking every single part of the leg, there's actually no evidence to support that that has any more utility than, than any other use, uh, maybe like spot testing signature testing like yourself tom it's also quite time intensive uh in certain instances it's quite impractical so if you uh meet uh, uh let's say you meet a, la a lady of uh, a different race a, a different uh, cultural background and she feels uncomfortable uh undressing uh in the presence of a man perhaps in the clinic then then we're already putting patients in uncomfortable positions and i've certainly been in many cases where they've not reported sensory changes in their thigh and they would not feel comfortable me uh having them test that area and i certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't feel comfortable uh, as well the but last then thing are I'm you suggesting adam that i mean like a sensory exam is um you know that is that is that is part of our fundamental neurological examination. Perhaps Adina Schmidt, as you said from that paper, will um, 
will look at it in a in far more in depth where if, if you're doing a circular approach towards the entire limb you, you're going to pick up a lot more and i take your point about maybe yes priming the patient they might feel different and sensation is is a very subjective thing you'll you'll test it one minute and they'll feel differences you test it again and they'll feel no differences um but uh, like if you're suggesting that it's difficult maybe to test some people uh from their sensory uh, perspective do you not think that we should still be doing some sort of sensory examination because and maybe yeah, maybe Anina's is yeah. is more elaborate but we still have to do it right so uh it. what i'm suggesting is the report is the screen okay so if they then report that they have a sensory deficit you will then decide if you're going to then examine that particular area and look at their various levels of sensory uh, appreciation so mm -hmm. if um so if you have um an area if you come in and you say there's an area down the lateral aspect of my calf uh feels numb or it feels different then okay right we're going to uh zoom into that part of your body we're going to think about our dermatomes and we're going to assess uh light touch appreciation sharp uh, appreciation uh, as as a standard so screen the power screen the reflexes because they have more implications and then your screening is a report based on an individualized sensory examination based on your clinical reasoning I think that to do indiscriminate testing um, is whilst it's whilst people say they do they do dermatomes we've got to be really honest about what they're actually doing okay to do it properly you've got to do it over the skin you've got to have the, the patient laying down you've got to have access to the leg um and i think that to do that to say we're doing that uh poorly or to to go the other way and indiscriminately assess the whole of the leg i think that's leaning into defensive medicine Hmm. Uh, I don't know. And, I'd have uh, to, um, like, I take your point. So, uh, you know, I, I'm i more of a fan of the fact that, look, we have to check their sensory. And I take your point that, OK, uh, we should maybe be testing people who have a self-reported uh, loss of sensation or change in sensation and that those are people to hone in on. And yes, anecdotally, yeah. those who say, oh, oh, I'm coming in with, look, my 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 big toe is completely numb. I say, OK. That's someone who's really aware of it and those are people who we really take note of but i can also think of many patients who i've done a center examination and they had no idea that they were numb in certain places for example and if we don't if we're waiting for people to report um uh patches of reduced sensation before we test them i think we stand the chance of missing of missing that sort of thing so how how would that inform your management so well certainly from a diagnosis point of view all right if i have if, if i go to uh speak to the surgeon someone has high levels of ridiculous pain plus a, a degree of numbness then my diagnosis changes from a ridiculous pain to a radiculopathy therefore it probably gets escalated up the up the channel with regards to whether people need to intervene certainly not as much as if they have a myotoma loss um and certainly not as if as much as if uh, they have a distinct uh, hypo-reflexic uh, pattern but I, I i i agree that maybe we wouldn't do surgery just based on uh on a sensory deficit but it does escalate the level or the severity of the condition i think in some ways and not only that it probably it if i think from a rea point of view it, it it's an it's a it would be a reassessment point for me so three months, six months down the line, has that sensation improved? And that might give both me and the patient some uh, uh, confidence that they're moving in the right direction, not only from a pain perspective, but from that the, the rest of the nerve function is also settling and improving. So uh, as a rebuttal to that, you don't mind me uh, rebuttaling that? In That's some what it's all about. If everyone uh, agrees, then there'd be no point with there so un under no circumstances is the surgeon going to want to operate mm. based on a, a sensory I'll, I'll say your point Gavin I like a as round a picture as you can but mm. the surgeon is not going to want to intervene based on the weight of of that that information 
No. So th that's the first point I would say. I think in terms of pre and post surgery, I think that if you are uh, decompressing an S1 nerve root and you, let's say you don't have any sensory symptoms, developing a baseline and then assessing that following surgery in relation to the fact that they've had surgery, I think that is very sensible. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that is uh, in keeping with that monitoring kind of uh, point that, that you were making, Tom. But, but I do feel that, that um, there, it'd be an interesting study to look at, but I, I do feel that um, to, there is a potential to fall into misinterpreting sensory symptoms that are reported um uh and potentially um i mean these are all great when they don't have any sensory symptoms it's what you're going to do when they then say this tiny patchy it feels slightly different so i think that some of it can be inconsequential potentially misinterpreted and i do feel as well that 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 i'd be interested to know practically if you've got a patient uh co coming into the clinic how you would adapt and, and perform the actual exam, uh, sensory examination, Tom. How do you approach that? Uh, so uh, I will use a neural tip, so sharp metal implement, a little needle point in each of the dermatomal areas. So in the lumbar spine, um, in the thigh, uh, L2 and 3, L, uh, L4, I'll go um, medial. I beg your pardon, <laughs> medial, uh, medial shin, lateral uh, malleolus, I'll, I'll go uh, for L5, as I will for the big toe, lateral foot, I'll go S1 and under the heel uh, for, S, for S1. And then I'll do light touch. And um, if I'm treating someone with chronic neuropathic pain, I, I would occasionally do, uh, I would look at their heat and cold sensitivity. Again, does that change my management? Possibly not, but it probably changes my prognosis in some way. If I see, see people with a lot of sensory discrepancies, we'll call them, um, if they're getting a lot of that on top of pain, in, anecdotally, I'm probably thinking that their prognosis isn't as good. And certainly if they're seeing change in their hot and cold, um, it's a, it's a, it, would, it would be a sign that there's uh, changes in the small fibers, and that starts to get a bit more problematic i think I, I i think that my my kind of thinking versus your thinking tom is I, i'm perhaps a little bit more economical uh, in my, that's the way i would maybe phrase it uh, i would also say you're describing signature points the mm. rebuttal to that would be well you're missing large areas of their tactile sensory territories mm -hmm. so if you're only looking at the, the point that you were making about picking up on areas, if you're only looking at one single point within a dermatome, yeah. then arguably the counter within an Ena's paper is that if you do it that way, then you do miss areas of, of sensory innovation, uh, including mm -hmm. peripheral territories. So um, arguably, it, you know, if I was to, to, to kind of do it with every patient, which I don't agree with, um, I would do it in a. I would do it circular, as to cover more more area, I guess. Mm. And then, and then my question to that is: Okay, you're going to pick up a load of stuff um, that may not be. As, which is why I don't. <laughs> yeah, which is going to be maybe not as helpful from a diagnosis point of view if I'm looking for a particular neurosegmentally distinct problem, i.e., a radiculopathy. Um, I feel if we don't do it at all, then we're going to miss them. We're not going to do it. So for the viewers listening, and we'll move on to the to the next point. For the viewers listening, you've got three options in how you wish to practice. You can go with the Anina Schmidt version, which is going to go uh, around in circulars around the entire limb and not miss a, a bit of skin. You can go with my preferred approach, which is going to be um uh dermatomal testing within the signature areas that have been shown to be the uh, most pertinent points of deficit within each dermatome as i've outlined or you can go with the adam dobson approach which is if the patient reports a deficit in symptoms then we test those adam have i picked you up right on that uh I, or I don't test them at all or is that or or so if uh, if a patient doesn't report a sensory deficit then i would be focusing on on other more 
other things that okay. may be more pertinent to test. Yeah. Like? So like their, their motor function, their mm. level of mechanosensitivity, sensitivity, their, mm. their story, their, their experiences, their, um, their values, their, their preferences, uh, which we'll get into uh, yeah. uh, around management. But, yeah. but the weighting, like we said, it's the weighting, you know, kind of can need to consider the weighting in terms of uh, uh, interventional management, I suppose. Yeah, no, I take your point. And that's really exactly what um, what All Things Vital is all about. We want differing opinions. Uh, if everyone agreed it's it's not uh, healthy, we need, we need people to challenge existing thinking um, and we need to discuss these things. So that was, that's good, Adam. And um, hopefully- The last thing I would say- all that. Last thing I would say, Tom, is neither of those approaches that you described have actually been tested. Mm. So, uh, so they remain opinions. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of a, based on experience, of course, but but they they are opinions nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, no, granted, granted. Okay, so we've assessed the patient. We've uh, decided that they have a radicular pain or a radicular pres or a radiculopathy. Let's call it a radicular presentation, if you like, to encompass both. What's what's the conservative management approach for these, Adam? What um, let's let's delve in. How how do we get patients with with these conditions better? That's really the the meat of the conversation. That's where we want to go. And maybe before we get into your approach, what does the evidence tell us? What's out there? So the the best study to be looking at, the more recent study uh, from last year, is uh, Dove et al. Yeah. which uh, they essentially. Uh, synthesized all the information on supposed physiotherapy type intervention. So I love your word, supposed. <laughs> yeah, well, it encompasses uh, a lots of different types of modalities. Many of those uh -huh. studies are quite old now. Uh, yeah. So actually, they're not as contemporary, but the, the evidence is the evidence, I guess. So they include them in the studies. Uh, the, ev the study found that um, the studies were highly heterogeneous in terms of their reporting of the the, the interventions the the methodology um the the advice that they were given to patients included very vi wide ranging interventions from bracing to uh absolute bed rest to laser uh and and everything in between so so the takeaway from that paper really is is that the studies are so of little quality and so heavily biased that you, you can't actually make any uh, any um, recommendations based on the the current re research. Mm -hmm. So so we're kind of in this position where we've got real life patients to support, mm -hmm. and we want to help them in the best way we can. But the research doesn't seem to be guiding that process, Tom. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was going to say that's a common story across uh, physiotherapy, but it's not really. Actually, we have we have uh, clearer ways of being able to manage, at least from an evidence point of view, other parts of the body. Radicular pain, as which I find quite fascinating, as we said, because of the burden it causes, because of the level of pain it causes. Interestingly, it's from a physiotherapy point of view, a conservative management point of view, it's really poorly studied. The, um, the studies that have done programs, a lot of them don't tell us what they've done. And what and some uh, studies where they have tell us what they've done, I contend as to why they've done it. There's no, doesn't seem to be a reasoning process there. And so a lot of the management of these patients is really up to clinical experience, which brings us to how we manage it. How do you manage it, Adam? Patient comes into you, uh, let's say, uh, let's say a moderate to severe eight week presentation of someone with uh, back and radicular pain. Um, maybe just just take us take us through it nice and smoothly. How do you approach the patient? What do you do? Well, what are your what's your style? So the, the overall goals, I guess, of, of our involvement, I like to think ourselves as, I think it's better to see ourselves as coaches, as, as uh, ex uh, supportive experts, uh, as facilitators. So the goals are we want to help them make sense of their experience. Mm. The goal might be to reduce suffering. Um, mm. And then the third goal 
is to perhaps aid their recovery while maintaining or working towards their activities, valued activities or function. So that's the kind of like overview of that. What what we what we want to do is approach it from a stepped care model. So we know that um, fast tracking patients to uh, kind of to surgeons or to triage clinics to look at more interventional management. We know that fast tracking patients on looking at particular attributes is no better than a stepped care approach. So when you look at the scopic trial, um, we know that that, that uh, um, was no more financial and also didn't lead to any better outcomes. Um, maybe uh, sorry, Adam, maybe maybe for uh, the viewers and listeners on this, you might you might just clarify those two models: the you know uh, a stepped approach versus other models. Yeah, you might just clarify what that means. Yeah, sure. Um, so a, a stepped approach is where we we enter um, a, a particular management chevron um, at the lowest le possible level. Um, so if we can uh, move in with advice and education and simple information and guidance, that will be the lowest chevron. Uh, moving up from that, you've got supported physiotherapy, so kind of spending time with someone for an X amount of time. Moving up from that, you're getting into interventional management, so consideration of a nerve root block, nerve root ejection, uh, and then the next chevron with that will be uh, consideration for surgical opinion, surgical intervention, microdiscectomy. Mm -hmm. So we we want to move, we want to enter the pathway at, at the lowest level. That doesn't necessarily mean everyone's starting at the beginning. That means that we're at the lowest reasonable level. Now, we need to consider lots of variables, I think. Uh, diagnostic confidence, as we discussed, is, is relevant. That might include MRI scan if we're, we're looking at interventional management at a target. We need to consider if there is any progressive neurological, so the three Ps, uh, progressive poly root or profound neurological decline. We don't want to be holding on to them. What's our patient's preferences, their level of disability, leg pain dominance, time frame, prognostics and symptom trends. So I spent a lot of time kind of working through what are these variables that we consciously or subconsciously are considering when we make those decisions on the ladder, Tom. So, um, so that's that's kind of how I would think about it. Uh, with the with the ex the example that you were given, if we look at the scopic trial, we know that by twelve weeks, fifty percent of people with radicular pain are somewhat better. Okay, mm -hmm. clarify um, somewhat. Is it, was was there any degree of improvement yeah yeah behavior. so that so these were people who were fully resolved or almost fully resolved so so they had very minimal symptoms or had they no symptoms at all and that was 50 percent uh, of that population so within that time frame you were given i think it was six to eight weeks we probably want to uh be offering uh some positive reinforcement that this could get better in a timely manner but that we've got to be patient with it. And out of interest, Adam, sorry, in that trial, in that first 12 weeks, was there any intervention other, other, other than advice and monitoring? So, yes, yeah, so that the um, the trial, it's not a trial of interventions. It's a trial of two types of pathways. So I guess that the they're assessing the pathway rather than the intervention. Okay. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily speak to uh, the interventions that they received, they left that very much uh, up to in the stepped approach, which is conventional management as things are now. Um, they left it to the discretion of the physiotherapist and then the triage clinician. So they left it the discretion if they were to move them on and to consider interventional management so okay, um, on, sorry on one arm you've got uh, it's a it's a physiotherapy led um, uh, paradigm if you like where if they feel that conservative management isn't being effective they can escalate it up the chain mm -hmm. and within that with that approach at 12 weeks so someone at 12 weeks could have had minimal intervention or they could have had a microdiscectomy is that what you're saying mm -hmm. and that at 12 yeah. weeks um 50 percent would be better okay so with that approach 50 yeah. percent so it's it, well. it's 
it's not a study it's not a prognostic trial as such um, mm -hmm. people were it, it's more of a, a kind of clinical course type uh kind of situation in terms of the time frame so it's useful data it's a, it's a very uh well done trial and and we're kind of it's it's kind of the best data that we have tom to okay. to offer patients sensible information on recovery times okay so okay so we can say which if you're using that approach a stepped approach that we could say look you've got a 50 percent chance of be doing pretty good in about 12 weeks there's obviously going to be variability in that if i think about management if i think about the management of radicular pain and radiculopathy um it's very easy to flare symptoms up on a patient um and so maybe a lot of the physiotherapeutic uh intervention if you like is about guiding and navigating mm -hmm. patients through those really painful periods now this is this is in a, this is in a subacute presentation the first episode of neuropathic pain of radicular pain and where if you put the right structures in place and for me that's a lot about that is not annoying their symptoms um taking out the aggravating factors to the best of the patient's ability in addition to good education about the natural progression of the presentation most of those patients do quite well but conversely i've certainly seen in uh at heard and been witness to patients getting very flared up with physiotherapy interventions um whether that's exercise or manual therapy or advice or anything like that. And they have a huge increase in symptoms based on that. And then that's considered failed physiotherapy. And then they go on to have uh, the next level of intervention, be that uh, injection or surgery. So maybe guide us a little bit more into depth how we can make sure and how you would make sure that yeah. maybe you've you've really tried everything as a physiotherapist you know so you've given us some broad uh, outlines regarding education but what does the nuts and bolts of that look like um, from a physiotherapy point of view before you're sure that you start to refer them on so just to kind of backtrack a little bit obviously we want to be explaining the nature of the problem i do like to use models uh and uh use their kind of examination results to ed educate and talk about the nature of the problem. Uh, we kind of touched on, I guess it's kind of the likely outcome in terms of time. So that, mm -hmm. that's obviously an important factor. I've developed, a, a, I can maybe share it with the listeners, Tom, but I've developed a very simple decision-making flow chart okay, um, great. Uh, around activity. Yeah. So, so the starting up, the question would be, is current activity too painful if the answer is yes and we can look at leisurely activity we can look at occupational activity incidental activity if if any of those activities that our patients doing is uh not tolerated well it's particularly flared up from doing let's say their favorite spin class tom uh then we might consider reducing or modifying some of those variables so rest is not a bad word it's not an evil word uh, and certainly in some cases, dialing things down, uh, working at the level that's more comfortable uh, is is absolutely the right idea. Uh, now, if they're comfortable with, uh, let's say, that same lady's doing a cycling uh, and she feels, you know what, I f it actually feels better when I'm cycling. Um, if that's at the level that she's uh, comfortable with, she's pushing herself, um, as per our usual routines, it might be that we just encourage that, right? Okay, right now, what we need to do is you're doing some great things. We want to we want to uh, reduce inflammation around those nerves. We want to get some mobility through your leg. Uh, and if this feels good, that's win-win. So I, I don't feel that physiotherapists need to necessarily always have to give an exercise. I don't think we necessarily always have to reinvent the wheel. If you're running and you feel comfortable running and it's not flaring up, it's tolerable, then we're going to work at that level and we're going to probably work on uh, educating on the nature of the problem and their time frame. And we want to support them through through maybe uh, some further visits. Um, if if uh, their current activity uh is uh too easy or maybe they're they're dialing down from things some patients do like exercises they do like therapeutic exercise 
So that's where we can perhaps come in and say, look, okay, um, uh, let, let's let's look at some stretching for your back. Let's do some, let's develop a, a program, a routine around moving and exercising that you feel you can manage uh, on a daily basis or every other day um, and, uh, and we'll work some additional exercise into that routine. So it, it very much depends on that person in front of you. I know it sounds very cheesy to say that, but it depends on what they're currently doing, how they're currently responding, uh, what their preferences are, um, and because uh, there's certainly no evidence that neurodynamics is any more superior that, than a cycling program or a walking program. Uh, I myself have suffered with ridiculous pain, Tom, and uh, I would uh, I would get out walking. Uh, are you back? I'm back. Did you lose me? I lost and, you, Jeremy. Yeah, go for it. And uh, that every day I get out along the river. I, I left the gym for a while because it was too uncomfortable. I go for a walk down the river. Uh, it would clear my mind. Um, it didn't feel great, but it was manageable. And I feel that that probably aided my recovery in the end. It moved the needle a little bit, and it mm. helped with my mental health. So mm. um, that that's when it comes to activity and some of the things that that physiotherapists do or intervene with or recommend that this is the way that I would approach it in the clinic, Tom. Okay. All right. So I take your point very much that sometimes there isn't, um, sometimes there isn't a need for us to always, to always give an exercise. Uh, I think giving them good advice and ultimately the um, sort of advice around the 12 weeks for me personally seems a bit, well, I shouldn't say that 50% improvement of, uh, sorry, fifty percent of the group will be in, people, yeah. improved in twelve weeks. That's probably that's probably decent. Um, I probably give people a time frame more along the four to six months if they've had a really aggressive, uh, ridiculous pain. That sort of pain where people really are unable to sleep. They're taking a high degree of medication of analgesics. Uh, they're really disabled. I would probably give them a longer time frame. Um, about around the exercise certainly maintain their general activity and do the things that they like to do uh, personally i'd probably take a more active therapeutic exercise approach maybe that's my bias uh, i would look at with these patients personally getting them to do a form of some form of uh, cardiovascular uh, exercise at a, at a 50 to 60 percent maximum effort um, in order to activate their uh, endogenous analgesic mechanisms that said and, and also to maintain fitness if that's their interest um i find that that works well if you can find a cardiovascular type exercise that doesn't irritate their symptoms which can be challenged so whether that's a bike whether that's the pool whether that's a run in, in certain cases um can be sometimes beneficial but they can the nature of these patients is that they're very easy to flare up uh we had a we had a comment earlier in the week from David Poulter, who's a um, uh, who comes from a McKenzie background, to ask whether there's any benefit in doing repeated exercise or repeated flexions or extensions to look at a centralization effect, which is where pain in the leg will travel towards the lumbar spine in response to repeated exercise. Um, does does that uh, land in your in your toolkit in your arsenal, Adam? What, what what do you think, Tom? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, doesn't know. I, I, no. I, I don't have any uh, major um, kind of uh, kind of problems with people uh, doing D, DPT kind of McKenzie uh, type activities. I would say it's a type of exposure therapy. It's a type of movement therapy. Uh, and it and it's giving a patient uh, something around movement to to work on because someone's give us a, a down vote there. Um, when you look at the uh, the research on that uh, of of uh, McKenzie, uh, mm. the evidence into lower back, which is what it's mainly kind of directed towards, that kind of directional preference uh, is equivocal no better mm. than any other approach when you look mm. at it in terms of ridiculous symptoms i could be wrong but proponents of mckenzie would say the 
di directional preference isn't really something that is often seen uh, in radicular pain. So, um, so that 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 might be a case that many of these patients maybe don't respond to that that type of approach. But but I I wouldn't claim to have a deep understanding of that particular sure. uh, uh, methodology, Tom. Sure. Uh, I think from a personal perspective, there's a it has it could have a role if you see a if you see and that's no different for any exercise. If you do an exercise and it reduces their symptoms within clinic, I think that's a pretty good starting point for a rehabilitation program. Um, the, you could that, say that about uh, back bending. You could say that about absolutely. bending your back. Absolutely, you could say that about tying your shoes or uh, or brushing mm -hmm. your teeth. If it if it reduces your pain, I'm pretty good with it as a starting point. Um, but ultimately, uh, I think that the, the research would show that uh, from that centralization effect that there is a degree of um, association with that with discogenic pain, where they've done studies. Uh, with regards to positive discography, so disc uh, stimulation, if you like, to see whether the disc is the source of the pain, and that and that correlates well, to, or not uh, correlates okay towards the centralization effect that you can get mm -hmm. to um, with repeated exercise. But it might be one thing I would use, but not everything. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to the exercise, in addition to the advice, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that one of the fundamental things you've said is actually not doing. Um, not feeling like you need to do a lot all the time with someone with, with, with a very painful, ridiculous pain because you run the risk of really annoying symptoms. And uh, then if people get escalated up the chain, uh, nerve root injections and um, nerve root injections and uh, other uh, surgical interventions are, you know, a potential and maybe maybe they could maybe they could be avoided, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I don't rule out the possibility that, that we can support people and move the needle. Uh, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that we can we can change an outcome. Uh, I, I think we just need to be humble uh, in mm. what is currently known and, and kind of uh, converge on our similarities rather than our, our differences in, in that respect. Just to yeah, go back yeah. to something that you said earlier, Tom, in, in terms of like when you look at the general populace, when you look at the general population, uh, you know, the idea that you're in all this pain, uh, you didn't exercise previously, and now we are then expecting them to do a very specific type of exercise. I think that we've got to kind of meet people where they are and, and compromise. Perhaps there is a kind of idealistic approach that we would say, I think this would be best and that might include cardiovascular exercise because there is some basic evidence for that but it, as you know in 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 the clinic life we we've got to kind of work with what they're willing to do and and what their preferences are and that, yeah. that might be a little bit away from our kind of ideals i guess yeah 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 absolutely it's about staying flexible and agile uh in in the face of the patient and kind of matching to what they want um, and to what they expect. Some patients do come in and they want a very structured exercise program. Others, and that's, that's uh, great, less yeah. so, you know. And then you can you you vary. So I think um, we're we're on the same wavelength there regarding that. Um, so look, we've covered that. Let's say a patient like isn't responding. You know, so we won't um, we won't spend too long on the next levels of injections and surgery because i'm going to get pain consultants and neurosurgeons to come in and talk about their craft but from our point of view in uh, therapy circles when do you start to consider escalating the patient up the chain for injection when do you consider sending them to the surgeon so uh, there's there's very little data in terms of prognostics in terms of who will respond be super responders to nerve root injections. So in terms of identifying the characteristics of people who will benefit the most from nerve root injections, that, that evidence doesn't currently exist. There is a study going on called the POISE trial. They're, they're working at our mm. trust, actually. We collected it. We're one of the sites uh, that is looking to answer that question, Tom. So that data may be coming. Mm. I, I, would say, I would say at this point, we still need to use a stepped approach 
because uh, there's a trial, the nerves trial, that that, that seemed to support that um, without a neurological deficit, the outcomes were were uh, comparable between injection versus discectomy. So moving mm -hmm. up to a, an injection to opposed to leaping to uh, a discectomy in the presence of no neurological deficit is reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that if if a patient uh, is struggling, um, if they have dominant leg pain, because obviously that's what we're looking to uh, change with our injections, that's what we're trying to influence. Um, if they have, following a discussion, uh, uh, a preference for a nerve root injection I'm talking about in the triage clinic at this point, then then if they understand the risks and the benefits and we feel there is a plausible mechanism by which we can influence that person's radicular pain and they have a preference towards it with no contraindications, then um, those are the kinds of things w which would lead me to then refer for imaging as a workup towards nerve root injection. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, we consider their time frame. We consider what they've tried previously. But essentially, it's kind of about can we dial down that suffering, and uh, yeah. and and that preferences and element comes in a bit more then. Yeah, yeah. I'd say from our um, from our service, a neurosurgery service, and maybe the patients I see here in clinic, they're they're always they're severe enough that, that 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 a nerve root block is always on the cards if they haven't already had one and uh you know the the effect that that, that nerve root block will have is will be greatly varied it seems to be very difficult to plan who will respond well or not uh I was chatting to an interventional radiologist last week when i was watching nerve root blocks taking place and he would say to the patient that you know we might get a 60% of patients who have the nerve root block will see a good improvement. Um, but I'm not sure what that's based off in, you know, it depends on the severity of the patient, etc. So, but it is, a, uh, it is worth um, certainly considering if conservative measures aren't really working. And also if just the patient is in a ton of pain, you know, I see some patients who've come in and I've seen uh, some acute radicular presentations and they're not appropriate for physio at all. They haven't got neurological deficit, but they're in so much pain. They really need pain pain management um, before we can actually go anywhere near them from an activity point of view. So I think they yeah. they pose a uh, it's important to know when to when to back back away. Really, the one thing I would say about it, and as I said, we'll, we are going to get surgeons and pain consultants on to discuss their area. Uh, as do, we'll see, some patients will really respond well to a nerve root block. They'll have raging sciatica, and the nerve root block has been miraculous. It will reduce their symptoms undoubtedly in a microdiscectomy, someone who's got a true um, contact of the disc onto the nerve and have, a, have an acute neuritis, you know, if, if the right patient is chosen for the right operation, uh, you know, uh, uh, the surgeons I work with will quote 80 to 90 percent will, will wake up with a vast reduction in their leg pain, which is fantastic for those patients. It comes down to like anything else we do, the choosing of those patients and unfortunately i have seen patients who have had nerve damage post injection long-term nerve damage year two year plus um which has made things worse i've certainly seen people who've had um long-term uh, nerve problems undoubtedly post-surgery as well so it's not something to be to go into lightly and i think uh the, the choice of patient here for those is really is really the key to to that tom i think just to kind of harker back to our first point is that the kind of heterogeneity of, of presentations as well that when our diagnostic confidence is is middling uh and they perhaps have somatic contributions potentially nociceptive radicular contributions but they're they're kind of less typical neuropathic uh, then you've got a, a, an MRI scan that is somewhat equivocal. Then, then you know, when we decide to try some intervention like an injection, you know, our, our certainty of their outcome is 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 muddy, isn't it? So mm. there's going to be people who um, we kind of go, well, it's reasonable to try, but their presentation and the information at hand is making their outcome quite uncertain. And it may yeah. be that they are essentially further down that spectrum 
um, because the barn doors are the barn doors, aren't they? The barn doors yeah. are a uh, band five physiotherapists could diagnose this. It's, it's the patients telling you the diagnosis within five minutes of meeting them. Um, it's, it's those chronic cases. It's those mixed somatic, uh, kind of, uh, widespread pain cases that, that unfortunately as things are, are often injected quite a lot. Um, mm. probably with, um, with, uh, questionable kind of, uh, reasoning around mm. that. But, but, uh, so, so I think that that's why the evidence, if you look at the Oliviera study shows that the, the, the kind of, they probably help some people in the short term. So it's not a magnificent result. Um, if you look at the NICE guidelines, they, uh, and the national back pain guidelines, they often actually say to do it very, if you can, like in your, your example, Tom, to do it early for the right person. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so, so then we're looking at our pathways set up to do that. And, and clearly yeah. there is uh, a lot of variation in, in oh, your ability to do that. Huge, huge variation, um, huge variation in that. All right, Adam. So look, I think we're going to start to put it together and wrap it up. Um, I'm going to ask the listeners, of which we've got quite a few, to see if anyone's got any specific questions that they'd like us to spend a couple of minutes on. So if you have any questions, do just put them uh, in the comments box. And uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for uh, if anyone has any questions, um, Adam, do you want to, uh, you know, Tell us a little bit of, uh, about maybe your top um, uh, publications in this area, things that you would say, maybe, you know, two or three articles that you really feel that people who have an interest in this could go on and read a little bit more about. Yeah, so keep, keeping with some of the, the, the mechanisms, some of the mechanistic, some of the pathophysiology, uh, which I think mm. is quite interesting. Uh, there's a nice paper. Schmidt, uh, Anina comes up in many of these papers, but uh, mm. Anina did. Anina Schmidt did a paper in 2020, entrapment neuropathies: a contemporary approach to pathophysiology, mm -hmm. clinical assessment, and management. So I think that's a nice paper to start to understand uh, how some of these presentations may be manifesting uh, in terms of their their physiology. That's the okay. first one. The, the second okay. one uh, is the paper by Bender, which is that okay. the neurological examination paper, which there's many good things to say about that paper. There's also some great videos uh, as a part of that paper that you can check out where Anina yeah. is actually doing the examination. So that's a good paper. I would probably also say to check out the Scopic trial, which is looking at that... Um, that kind of pathway comparison between fast track and stepped care, which supports essentially the most conventional approach to managing these patients currently. Mm -hmm. That's okay. three, three papers, Tom. Three papers. All right. Um, the last thing then we say, uh, don't see any questions coming through there. So um, <laughs> I don't think now that I can see too much so i'll tell you what adam why don't you tell us what would be your your top clinical takeaways here on this topic if you were to like really summarize for clinicians um you know, what they should take away from this what would it what would it be do you think um so from an examination perspective i'd recommend extensive practice with a reflex hammer <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I'm uh, I'm obsessed with my hammer. Um, okay. As much exposure you can get in order to be certain that something is wrong. Yeah. You need to understand all the variations of normal. So when it comes to reflex testing, uh, you you need to see what normal is, and you need to practice that regularly in order to interpret pathological responses. Um, a good example would be that some people generally have quite very responsive reflexes, hyperreflexia, but it's not necessarily pathological. Uh, some people have, when you hit their biceps tendon, they'll get finger flexion. And that's mm -hmm. actually quite a normal response. But mm -hmm. in the hands of someone who doesn't test regularly, 
that might be considered uh, some kind of abnormal upper tract sign. So know what's normal, test reflexes, handling skills, get your hammer out. I think it's also helpful with cognitive reassurance, isn't it? So examining your patient regularly, even in even in those back pain patients I would examine in order to illustrate that I'm not concerned about the health of their nerve roots, that it isn't okay. a trap nerve, for instance. Um, and the second thing really is, is, is to get comfortable with these things taking a while to get better. Sure, uh, we, sure. We've got to be patient with recovery uh and uh and kind of be a, a kind of a, a guide and support for our patients to oppose to this idea that we're looking to fix them and push things back in place or offer kind of a miraculous within session results um yeah. so so that would be my second point tom okay great a uh, couple of questions have come through there um on that respect, uh, can you explain why radicular pain is felt down a limb when the lesion can occur in the root pre dorsal root ganglion? That's a, that that's is a one. that is a fantastic question. Uh, and and no, I know that our is, own David Poulter, uh, and, uh, no doubt. Yeah, I, I think it has something to do with the um, the the so from synapse to synapse if, if let's say um, you have uh, uh, um, a connection from your big toe uh, all the way up to your lumbar spine then the, these neurons travel long distances so if you've got activity within a singular neuron then then that could well propagate uh, throughout the full length of the neuron which may explain why uh, these these problems manifest away from the irritation. I think the, mm. the the actual answer is no one actually knows the answer to that. No, but no, um, so no. that would be. I think I think you gave a pretty good uh, answer, dear Adam, um, in in a for a pretty unknown answerable question. I think at present in science, I think I think I think I'm happy to to run with your explanation there on a mm. Thursday evening. Uh, the, the other thing to say on that as well is is that the idea that you know is the pain actually traveling down the leg you feel it in the leg but is it traveling down the leg um and uh that that would be uh, a debatable uh, concept i think yeah sure all right so look i think we've covered quite a lot we've covered the terminology we've covered just uh, covered the mechanisms. We've covered the clinical presentations, the diagnosis, the assessment. We've covered management. Um, we've covered that there's a lot of work to be done in the research. And uh, we've discussed, you know, a couple of at least myself and Adam's approaches to how we manage this in the clinic. And then we've discussed when uh, when we kind of need to, need to step it up. And I'm extremely grateful to Adam this evening for giving his uh, his time and his expertise. And I hope that was helpful for uh, our listeners and our viewers this evening. Uh, where can we find a little bit uh, more about you, Adam? And where do you tend to hang out? Where can we see you, hear you? Uh, so I am on, on social media fairly prolifically so at at adam dobson one two three uh, uh on twitter um i'm not currently on instagram tom i apologies um uh, we also have shame on you uh, shame on you adam uh uh and uh, we've got a fantastic website that that we're developing out so uh south tees back pain uh our local nhs website we're using as a platform to, to mm. develop patient facing resources we've got a uh, um well i would say because i wrote it but we've got a um a patient facing article called 10 sciatica facts uh mm. and that uh, that we use that often with patients as a uh, uh, to to go through the ins and outs sensible information on sciatica stenosis great on movement therapy that kind of thing great adam give us all those uh, links We'll do a we'll do a big post after all this and add them all in the show notes for later use. Uh, Adam, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure having you all on board you. here. Uh, 
being the uh the on our maiden voyage here on all things spinal i really appreciate you um, uh giving your expertise on the matter so uh, thank you very much uh <laughs> i wish you the best of luck please. tom and said i wish oh, you the best of luck much. with the adventure oh you're very good thanks very thanks very, very much mate we're going to have you uh back for stenosis at a later stage hopefully um once we've gotten through a few other areas uh okay sir so that's adam dobson thank you very much um i'm thomas deckers i hope that that was uh, helpful i hope you enjoyed this evening and uh we have our next all things spinal coming in a few weeks i'll be uh letting uh you all know who that's going to be um but it's a a, a major uh player in the in the back pain world and uh, that is coming on March 21st in the evening, Thursday again, uh, details to come. So hope you all go well and enjoy your clinical practice. We will see you again on all things spinal. I'm Thomas Deckers. All the best. <laughs>